Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to thank everybody for showing up. Um, as everybody knows, California is in a severe drought, and the uh, state has mandated that the cities uh, reduce 25% uh, across the board for, for a, a state level, uh, Ripon, because of the fact we have a real high water uh, usage per, per person per day, we're required to reduce 36%. So the city's trying to do everything it can to get the message out on how to conserve water, um, different methods. And uh, so this is one of, uh, one of several uh, seminars we're going to have. Uh, Master Gardener, San Joaquin County Master Gardener program is nice enough to put the presentations on. We've had this is our second. Uh, we had one two weeks ago that uh, Marcy put on for us. Excellent presentation. We're going to be doing it again on uh, June 20th here. Uh, we'll be publishing that uh, that time, but it's going to be um, talking about how to re how to reduce your residential water use, which I think is a big big interest. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Marcy Souza from the San Joaquin County uh, Master Gardener Program. She's going to put on our presentation tonight. Second. Okay, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're we're going to wing it, as I call it, due to a little few IT. Uh, technical glitches and so I'm gonna kind of be pacing back and forth so if you can't see me I'm not being rude it just depends on what computer I can get to to advance the the slide screens so first off I'd like to introduce myself my name is Marcy Souza and I am the Master Gardener program coordinator here in San Joaquin County so how many of you have ever heard of the Master Gardener program before before the flyer tonight okay perfect <laughs> good so the Master Gardeners um, were part of the University of California we are housed here in San Joaquin County, so we um, represent the residents of San Joaquin County and we educate the residents of San Joaquin County. Um, the, the Master Gardener program is a national program, it's a statewide program, and here in San Joaquin County, it, if you've been around in the county for a while, 30 years ago we had a program and about 20 or so now, um, 20 years or so, the program disappeared. The advisor left, the money left, and so the program just kind of fizzled. And so I was hired on in 2007 to revive the Master Gardener program here in the county and to get some new volunteers trained and start our outreach um, projects that we do in the county. So we teach workshops like this. We have Saturday workshops. We're involved in school and community gardens. We have a hotline office. So say today after this presentation you want some more plant lists we can mail you that if you have problems with your tomatoes you can call in email us or bring us samples and we can help diagnose um, what's going on with your plants um, all kinds of things and so we're here's a resource um, it's a free program to you guys so there's no charge in calling us uh, we don't do house calls that's the only thing that we don't do but we have lots of information that is all UC science-based information that we distribute to the public. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So what do you think of when you think of low water use plants? Tumbleweed, all right. This is just a, we're, we're gonna have fun with this tonight, um, but we're gonna talk about how you can create a water efficient landscape. And um, for some of you, Realistically, it's not practical to rip everything out and start over. So some of this, you may be ready to, to tackle a big project and this will apply to you. And other of, others of you, it'll bits and pieces will apply to you of what you can take out of this that you'll be able to apply in your own landscape at home and what you can do to conserve water. So some or all take what you, you can apply on your own personal basis. So if you were at the uh, presentation two weeks ago, a few of these slides might be repeats, but majority of the presentation is, is all new content. But this is just to show you, this is Half Dome um, in 2011, before we were in our official four-year <laughs> drought that we're in now. Here we have 2012, 13, 14. This is all the same time period in March. And this was this year, March 19th. So, you know, as Ted said, it's, it's now obvious to everybody, I think, that California is in a drought. And what are we all going to do to help conserve water? I think that's what we need to be thinking about. 
So just to give you some numbers, um, and again, this is a repeat slide from last time, but basically the governor has a statewide mandate to reduce water by 25%, um, depending on where you're at. Rip in, for example, is a tier nine, so you guys are 36%. Lodi is 36%. Um, some cities are 25, 30%. So it just depends on your water use in the past. Um, from the American Water Works Association, just to give you an idea, 85% of water use is typically overwatering problems. So something that we can do that's an easy fix or part of a fix is as master gardeners, teach people how to properly water, how to conserve water, and you know, hopefully bring that 85% down significantly. Um, to put it into perspective, in order for us to reduce our water use by 25%, on average, every California would need to save at least 40 gallons per person every day. That's on a statewide, we're lumping the whole state into one. Um, and obviously, you know, ripping at 36 would be more, and other, other places it might have a little bit less um, would be would be less than that, that 25 or that 40 gallons. So let's see. So we can talk about ripping out our lawns and not watering our plants, letting things die, or you know, catching the water in the shower to go water your patio plants. I know people do it. My sister's doing that. Uh, my boss's wife does it. So. But the, the thing that we really need to think about is the challenge that we're going to face as Californians. It's a, it's a whole change of the way that we use water. So it's, it's not a short time fix of, well, I'm going to let my lawn die. And then as soon as it starts raining, I'm going to go back to the way I've always watered, which is most likely overwatering, because we're just going to put ourselves right back into the same position that we're in um, you know, once we're out of this drought and, and we have all this rain that we're all hoping and wishing for. So what we really need to do is change the way that people garden, the way they water, the way they think. And that's not always as easy to um, do as it is to say. And so this is what I'm hoping today that you guys will take a few things back that you can share with friends and family or that you yourselves can do in your own home landscape. So here's our population growth, and, and this is part of the issue, is that our population continues to rise as our water continues to drop. So this is why just not watering your lawns is not going to be a permanent fix. Again, we need to change, you know, water the lawn, but water the lawn correctly. And it's projected, you can see, by 2020, 42 to 48 million of us. And where are we all going to fit? So when we're talking about water conservation, um, you know, we don't want water conservation to have a negative connection to it. We don't want to think brown lawns, um, you know, tumbleweeds, like that first slide. So water conservation really should be rewarding. You should feel good about it, that you're doing something, stewardship to our environment. Um, so ethically, you should feel good about it. Um, aesthetically, it should be rewarding. So by reducing your water, you should still be able to have a nice looking landscape that you're proud of. Um, and then financially, it should be you know, rewarding um, and, and not a hardship. We're not looking at things you know, to reduce our water. You have to spend your vacation budget you know, that you have set aside for this year. So often those top two pictures, I don't know if you guys can see them. The first one is basically the front yard is gravel, rocks. Um, and then the top right picture, it's weedy, um, dirt, and that slide. And then the two bottom ones is what we're trying to encourage people of what you can actually have as a water conserving landscape. So it can look nice. So some steps we're going to talk, I believe there's nine that we're going to talk about today um, in converting your landscape to a low water use landscape. So you need to assess and prior prioritize your plants and remove unwanted plants. And we're going to talk more about each of these. Assess your irrigation, install or convert irrigation to most efficient for the space. So I just heard somebody say, um, they've already replaced their sprinklers to more efficient sprinklers. That could be something that if you have old, outdated um, sprinklers in your front lawn that aren't uniformly spraying. Um, there's, there's so many new things out on the market now that help conserve water, yet distribute the water, e water evenly. 
that you could per perhaps purchase. Um, look at your soil. We need to take a look at our soil and add compost if needed, and we'll talk more about why compost is important. Make a plan. Don't just go into this not knowing um, what you want to do, what you're going to do, what you can afford to do. Do a little bit of research. Oh, good. We're going out of order. Okay. Um, use mulch. So cover bare soil with mulch. Uh, remove part or all of your turf. Turf, Or if you're going to keep turf, keep it healthy. And we're going to talk about both of those concepts. Um, if you're going to plant new material, make sure you're doing it at the right time. And then we'll talk a little bit about adding hardscapes to your landscape to help conserve water. So prioritize your plants and trees. Um, Plants aren't children. It's okay to get rid of them if they don't perform. You can, you can dig up a plant, you can get, recycle them, compost them, put them in the green waste bin, but if they're not making you happy, if they're not, you know, if they're not, they require way too much water, it's okay to take a plant out. So remove high maintenance plants, um, remove high water users, and anything that you just don't like. Again, if you don't have this sentimental connection, get rid of it. Build around what you like and what looks good. Um, we're going to talk more about hydrozoning, but move plants together with similar water needs. And make a list of plants you'd like um, in or for your empty spaces. And so again, that kind of connects back to coming up with a plan. So prioritizing your plants. Um, everyone should be doing this uh, if you have anything growing in your landscape. But determine which ones are the most susceptible to water stress. And high on your watering list should be plants that are valuable in terms of cost. So what would it cost to replace that plant? Um, and prominence in the landscape and for your enjoyment. So, and that can also be, um, think, consider benefits to your home. So maybe a large tree that provides shade that helps keep your house cooler or your backyard cool. You know, we want to keep that tree alive rather than avoid watering it, and then all of a sudden this large 40-year-old tree dies, and it's going to take you know, a long time to replace that tree as far as the size and the cost of taking it out and planting a new tree, and potentially your energy bill and all those other things that would be connected to it. So on our list, um, high would be trees and shrubs, and larger shrubs I would, we're talking about, so not you know, something smaller, um, but something that's well established. We would put that on the high list, high priority. Um, the medium would be perennials, so things that are established in the yard. Edibles, so that includes fruit and nut trees and vegetables. And then turf that's less than a year old. Um, and that's just because it's the root system's not very deep on it yet, and we want to keep that alive if you're considering keeping your turf. And then low would be annuals, so those six packs that you plant, you know, just to make the walkway look pretty, and then you pull them out once they're leggy and done blooming and we put something else in for the fall. That's on our low list. Um, herbs typically are a little more thirsty, not all of them. Um, we're going to talk about actually some that aren't. Ornamental grasses and established turf. And established turf is on the low end because established turf typically has deeper root systems that can handle less water and many grasses. Um, I talked about my Bermuda grass last time. It can be brown and dry, and if I give it two good waterings, it perks right back up and it's green again, and you know it can come back much easier. It's also a 40-year-old lawn, so the root system's much deeper, um, and it's a hardy turf. So we put the, the established turfs on the lower list of priority for watering. So another bullet point that we talked about, and I'm sorry, these are out of order, um, is assess your irrigation. So look at the controller. What are the settings? What is your controller set at? Do you know how to change them? Um, if you live in a newer home, many of the things we find is the landscapers are going to set your irrigation controllers on a um, establishment irrigation cycle to get the newly planted plants in your yard established. And many people move into these new housing developments and never think to change their controllers. And so these plants, again, are being overwatered, that 85%. Um, of water use, water waste, in overwatering plants. So find your valves. What do they water? Do you know where the water is being directed from what source in your yard? Um, 
which stations on your controller, so now we've looked at the controller, are assigned to each valve. So learn your irrigation system. And find all your sprinkler heads. And that's, we're gonna talk more about maintenance, but that comes in and just making sure our sprinklers are working, um, that they're not busted off by the lawnmower or overgrown with grass or something like that. Um, that could be, uh, or broken, you know, a broken sprinkler underneath that could be leaking. So something to keep in mind is that irrigation systems do need regular maintenance to keep them effectively and efficiently working. So just like I talked about, um, frozen pipes in the winter, we want to check, check that. Uh, sprinklers, dogs. I've seen dogs chew off sprinkler heads, you know, just for a new toy to play with. Um, checking for leaks. And you really, right now especially, should go out and inspect your system on a monthly basis. So check for that overgrown grass. You know, that warm weather sometimes can have a spurt of grass growth and all of a sudden, you know, your sprinkler's being blocked because of weeds or turf or something um, that's prohibiting the sprinkler from distributing water evenly. So adjust your sprinkler heads. You know, how many of you gone out there and the sprinkler head's stuck? It's not moving, you know, perhaps with the rest of them. So go out and make sure they're all correctly moving. Um, make sure you're not watering the sidewalks or the street, which happens quite frequently. We call that urban drool, um, where the water's running down the sidewalk when we're watering our lawns. Convert to inline drip. And so that's something I'm gonna briefly talk about um, inline drip is good in shrub beds, in borders, um, in those medians, uh, in roadways, or maybe in front of your house between the sidewalk and the road that you really can't do much with. You know, a lot of people just have dirt or trees and, and grass, but they might be on a sprinkler type system. Um, and in areas where you have ground cover. And the reason why we like inline drip is as these shrubs grow bigger, as your ground cover continues to grow, um, your sprinklers typically become blocked by these plants as they're overhead, or the water does not penetrate. So if you're watering at ground level, we're not, the water's not being blocked by the plants. And uh, inline drip is very efficient if it's installed properly. So what is inline drip? Um, we are fans of Netafim out at, with the Master Gardener program. So our demo area, which I'll show some pictures of later, our demonstration garden, we have Netafim in that. And then our Master Gardeners recently did a landscape project in downtown Lodi on School Street in front of the post office. And that is all um, Netafim inline drip for the irrigation um, there as well. But basically, inline drip is tubing with um, internal emitters. You lay it in a grid pattern, so if you can see the the picture, those hose looking lines, and you can actually move it around the plants uh, depending on what you have planted where. There's different emitters rates and there's different emitter spacing. So really you can customize it to your current landscape that you have, um, where you want the emitters to be, how much water you want the emitters to emit. So you can loop it, you can go back and forth. Um, there's another picture here coming up. So inline drip works well. One of the, the um, problems that people run into is their hoses or their tubing kinking as they're trying to work with it. Um, so think of kind of a hard plastic soaker hose type material or even a garden hose. If you're trying to bend it, often it'll kink. So one of the things, just if you're considering using drip, is to put it out in the sun and let it warm up some so that it becomes more pliable and more flexible to reduce those uh, kinks. Um, you do use staples, large garden staples, to um, attach or to hold the drip line from moving. So use something hard to push that in so that it gets all the way in. Often, you know, think of um, putting croquet stakes into the lawn. You can get so far down and then it just doesn't go anymore. So you might need to get some type of pallet, mallet or um, hammer or something to get those lawn, turf, yard staples in. And if the curves are too sharp, use an elbow. So that's something that we run into where the flow of the water, you can purchase elbows um, to install when you're putting uh, inline drip in. And Master Gardeners have more information at the office on putting in drip systems. If that's something that you're interested, we could send you. I'm not gonna go into um, the specifics tonight of how to do that, because it might not be the thing for everybody. You can do, this is what I wanted to show you. So loops, so see we have a tree here, so we can make it go in a, a circle. 
around trees or around shrubs if you just have one thing that you're trying to water. So it's very uh, versatile um, and you can customize it to your landscape. Here we've got a smaller grid for a few plants so we're not having to water a large area. So the other thing related to irrigation would be to consider smart technology. Um, the statistic, and I didn't put it in this one, I think it's 50% um, of people with clock or dial controllers, smart controllers even, or the, the older style, older model, hand dial uh, irrigation controllers, are 50% of people that have those typically overwater more than those that don't. Because again, they're not going out and adjusting them to the seasons, whereas if you have to go out and hand turn on the sprinklers, you're very aware of when you turn them on last, um, it's raining outside, so obviously I'm not gonna go out and turn on my sprinklers versus the timer's automatically set to come on. So consider smart technology, um, and that there's lots of smart irrigation controllers. I have a picture of one coming up. But many of those have moisture sensors that are connected to the system. So again, out at the Ag Center, at our demo garden, we have sensors in the ground that will overrun the irrigation controller if it rained or if there's any noticeable, measurable moisture in the soil. So maybe we had a good rain for two days in a row and our, on Monday, Tuesday, and our irrigation controller in this particular garden is set to come on on Wednesday. It will bypass and, and basically um, trip the controller so that it, the irrigation system doesn't come on. And they're just little soil probes that go in the, round, the ground that are connected um, back to the irrigation controller. And they also work off of the Simis weather stations that many of the farmers use to base their irrigation off of. So they are, they're very um, intelligent uh, irrigate, irrigation controllers. You can also, they make um, rain shutoff switches, which is that picture on the bottom right that you can attach to the gutter that it's a rain sensor basically. So maybe you don't wanna go and retrofit your existing irrigation system. This is something that you can put on that connects right to your irrigation controller. And if it rains, um, it will, again, tell the irrigation controller there's no need to come on because they're, it's sensing water. And then don't forget to change the batteries in your controller. So if you don't have an irrigation controller that plugs into the wall, um, it's recommended that when you change your smoke alarm batteries, you go out and change your irrigation controller batteries if you're on a battery-operated system. And that's more to keep your plants alive so that the irrigation controller comes on, obviously. So assessing your soil, go out, dig a hole, get dirty, and take a look at your soil quality. And soil quality plays a big part in water conservation of how much water your soil will retain. Um, so look, do you have any earthworms or other or, um, living critters, roly polies, pill bugs, earwigs even? Um, is there anything crawling around in that hole, that handful of soil that you're holding? Is there any organic matter that could be any are there weeds growing on top, or does your patch of soil look like a cement parking lot where it's just sterile and the weeds aren't even growing? Um, is there organic matter inside, decomposing leaves and things that, again, those decomposer insects might be working on? Is there a soil crust? So can you kind of pick up a plate? There's some soils, and I'm sure you guys have all seen a sample, you know, example of this, where you can almost, it's like the soil has a lid. The whole top of the area of soil comes off as a crust. Um, you know, do you have that? Is there moisture? Can you squeeze your soil and make any type of ball um, with it? Or does it just fly away, you know, like dusty sand, like you're at the beach? Um, the structure, and some of those things you can't change. We can amend them, but we can't, you know, if you have sandy soil, you have sandy soil. We can add things to it to make it better, but we can't change sandy <laughs> soil to clay or a loam soil. Um, looking at the structure and the texture, so how does it feel? And the smell. What does it smell like? Soil should have an earthy smell, like you're taking a walk through big trees or something, or through the mountains, where it just has that very natural, nature, green smell. Um, if you have s sulfur or sour-smelling soil, you probably have a, a, a drainage issue, um, or discolored soil. If it's blue, any shades of blue, that's typically a drainage issue. So that can also be something um, that you want to address, because if the water's not um, infiltrating through the soil, tree roots that run deeper, um, you know, shrub roots that don't maybe collect the water in the top 10 inches of soil are gonna have a hard time uh, getting their water source if it's not getting through that hard pan or whatever the drainage issue may be. So if it smells, we don't want 
sour or pungent smelling, we want earthy smelling. And again, I, I mentioned that soil type plays a large part in retaining water. So remind me, Ripon, I think there was a kind of a mix at the last meeting of a, of a sandy loam to some more sand, sand, maybe if you're on the northern end towards Manteca, because I know Manteca has a lot of sand, sandy loam. Anybody have clay? You probably have clay out off of Jack Tone, don't you? Yeah. So clay, clay soil is great at holding water. Sometimes it can hold too much water. And sandy soil, the water just goes right through it. Um, and so clay soils, it, this can also play into how often you water. So typically, my clay soil vegetable garden, my tomatoes, I can go once, you know, watering them once a week because the water, the clay soil will hold so much water. And you can, you know, I've trained my tomatoes to get used to once a week watering. Where if you're in a sandy soil, that water is just going to go right through. You may need to water three times a week to keep your tomatoes alive. And before you plant anything, make sure you loosen the soil. Again, trying to break up that hard pan if possible um, to increase water penetration to get to root zones. How many of you guys have a, a shallow hard pan? Can you guys get a shovel? Shovel all the way in? Good. That's good. Um, again, we talked about this. So That's just the visual to go with it of the different soil types. So adding organic matter, um, a cubic foot of soil can hold roughly one and a half quarts of water for each 1% of organic matter. So this can be just as easy as adding compost. Um, to your soil. It's full of microbes. It will help sandier soils retain water, and it will help clay soils uh, let water infiltrate by providing more pore space. So it kind of gets in the middle of all those clay particles and helps to loosen it up some so that it's not packed in together like Play-Doh or like clay. So make a plan. Um, once you've kind of gone out and assessed these things in your garden, you've looked at your irrigation system, you've prioritized your plants, you've looked at your soil, come back inside and think about what you want to do. So make a, a, a long-term goal and vision. Ultimately, what would you like to change? And again, we're not just thinking, I'm going to stop watering my lawn until it starts raining, and then I'm going to go back to the old, you know, how I, I've always done it, because that's the way you do it. What do I want to accomplish? Um, in, in the landscape. You've got to consider your budget. Again, budget plays a very important part, um, perhaps in what you feasibly can do or what you do when. So that might also help in prior prioritizing, you know, right now we can afford to, th to do this, but we need to save up to put in some hardscaping um, because that's going to cost. Pavers are going to cost a little bit more. It's going to cost more to rip out the, the sidewalk that doesn't allow any water to penetrate through it and to put in a water permeable sidewalk. Um, think about your plant selection in lists. So again, we are talking about, um, you know, dig out the Sunset Western Garden book and start looking at plants that you might like. I'll give you some tools that are online to do plant searches for low and very low water use plants. Draw out your ideas. Get out a, you know, piece of scratch paper or a blank piece of paper and a pencil and kind of sketch how you'd like it to look. Um, it's always good, and that's a good way of communicating to your significant other of what you're visualizing, because I know if I describe something in my head, my husband would probably imagine it a completely different way. So sit down and draw out your ideas um, on paper. And then again, prioritize your projects, and that's all, everything's all interconnected. Necessarily can't do it all at once, and that's okay. Go visit some demonstration gardens. So if you're ever driving through Stockton, our office is right off of Arch Road in 99. Um, we're, we back right up to the Stockton airport. And so we're not very far from the freeway, mile and a half. And we have a very nice demonstration landscape um, out there that our master gardeners have developed. They maintain and they take care of. So come out. Our plants are labeled. Um, you can come out on the weekends. It's not gated or anything. So you can take a stroll through our garden and look at the different beds. We have a Mediterranean section, a California native section, um, a pollinator section, uh, Arboretum All-Stars, which is a UC Davis program of plants that do really well in the valley, um, an edible landscape that incorporates edibles with perennials and things like that to show how you can incorporate colorful Swiss chard in with um, gerrymander, for example, or something so that, you know, Maybe you want to put some edible plants in your front yard. It doesn't have to look like your typical vegetable garden, rows, boxes. You can mix in 
lettuces and things like that with other existing plants. So you can come out and see us. So here's some pictures of our, our garden. Here's some more pictures from our garden, if you can see them. And these, uh, this presentation will be online too, so you'll be able to see colorful photos. The UC Davis, um, if you're ever heading up that way or want to take a trip, they have a beautiful arboretum that's much larger than ours um, that you can take a self-guided tour through. They have maps online that you can print ahead of time, but they have lots of plants, lots more than we do. Um, so I, I recommend going to you know, open public gardens to look at their low water using, low water using plants to get some ideas. And you, know, you might look at something in a book and it sounds good and it looks pretty, but go see it in real person in an established garden. It may be way too big. It might not be the right plant for the space that you're, you're wanting to plant it. Or it may be too small. Or you may realize, realize, wow, that has really sharp, pokey thorns, which might not be so great for the grandkids or, you know, something like that. So, okay, mulching. That was another bullet point that we talked about. So why mulch? Mulch reduces water loss to evaporation. Um, it helps to moderate or keep our soil temperature cool, uh, which in return helps reduce stress on our plants um, and increases the good guys in our soil, the biological activity that's going on. They don't like it hot. They don't want to bake in the soil. So they'll go deeper down or die off. So if we can keep our soil temperatures moderate or moderately cool, um, that's good for everybody. Mulch helps to reduce runoff. So rather than bare soil, when we do irrigate or when it does rain, having something there to hold the soil in is definitely beneficial. It increases filtration by preventing that crusting. So that top layer that I talked about where the whole, it's kind of like just a, a lid to the soil that you can move around. Um, mulch helps to reduce that. Water doesn't penetrate through that crust. So having mulch helps keep our, our softer, more our, our soil more permeable and an improved tilth, we call it. And it helps to improve soil texture over time. So again, we're not drying out. We're not getting hard, blocky soil. We have nice, crumbly, rich, soft soil, ideally. One thing to note about uh, using mulch is that if you're using a sprinkler-type system to irrigate, you're, you have to consider the water needs to be able to get through the bark or the shredded bark or the wood or whatever it is that you're using to actually reach the plant. So you can run your sprinklers for 10 minutes, but you need to actually get in and check to see, has the water reached the soil? And if it has, how deep has it penetrated um, once it absorbs and works its way through all the nooks and crannies of whatever type of mulch that you're using. So some other um, benefits to mulch is that it helps, we're helping to reduce green waste if we're out mulching in the garden. So we're repurposing perhaps tree chips um, or you can even mulch with leaves and things like that from your yard. It doesn't have to be something that you purchase. You can go out and spread a layer of leaf litter, and that will help keep water in, temperature down, and even help suppress the weeds, which I have next. Um, so if we're helping to block out the weeds, weeds do compete for water, and we don't want that. We want our, the plants that we want in our landscape to have all the available water. And it does make a landscape look nice and tidy. It's just that's an extra benefit to using some type of mulch. So some things to keep in mind if you are using mulch is to keep mulch three to four inches away from the trunk or the stem of the plant, so trees, um, shrubs. We don't want to pile, make the volcano of mulch around your tree trunk or your, your shrubs. We want to keep um, a circle, and that helps to prevent crown and root rots. So if trees are constantly wet, you have a very good chance of um, killing them by wet feet or this rot that can occur at the crown or the base uh, where the tree goes into the, the soil, that line. Using organic mulches are much better, especially when we're talking about the drought, than using rocks or gravel if we have plants in the area. So we're talking about using rocks or gravel around plants that are planted just because those heat up so much more than, say, wood chips would and dry, can dry out the soil faster, can burn the plants. So if you've ever had plants, clo uh, plants planted close to a, a cement wall or if you've ever seen plants on the side of a building that gets really hot, a lot of times those plants will look scorched and water stressed and it's just because they're basically baking. Um, at my house that we're renting, uh, they have a planter bed that has brick 
all the way around it. And my lantana is really hardy. It doesn't take a lot of water, but when it's 106, it's like a brick pizza oven. Um, you know, between the brick border and then the cement patio that's around it, it just gets so hot um, that it, it bakes my lantana even. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't even use brick as a border if I, if I had my way. Make sure you leave, that you do leave some bare soil someplace in your yard because bees are, are a hot topic as well right now. And there are many California native bees that do like to burrow into the ground. So you'll see little holes. And if you ever see bees darting into your lawn and they don't come back out or into a bare patch of soil that you may have out in the garden or your landscape, they will build tunnels in the soil and that's where their nests are. They don't nest in hives or trees like we're used to. Um, they'll nest in the soil. So Make sure we leave some bare soil um, for our, our California native bees that are, are the ground dwellers. Yes? Can you use lawn clippings as mulch? Can you can. It does get hot. So the question was, can you use lawn clippings as, as mulch? And you can, but lawn clippings can get very hot, and um, lawn clippings are very high in nitrogen. So you have to be careful if you place them too close to other plants. You can burn them not only temperature-wise, but the amount of nitrogen that you're applying constantly into the soil can be too much nitrogen, and it's almost like a fertilizer burn. So plants can only, only need so much nitrogen. So just, you can use it, but I would use it lightly. I would save compost lawn clippings for a compost pile that you could create compost to then improve your soil quality. So lawn be gone, now we're gonna talk about turf. And I'm not gonna just focus on getting rid of turf, we're gonna talk about both sides of, of having a healthy lawn as well as getting rid of it. So from the Environmental Protection um, Agency, and it depends on the city, 30 to 60% of urban fresh water is used for watering our lawns. And so the idea that we wanna get across is that reducing your lawn or taking out your lawn does not necessarily mean it's gonna be ugly. There's ways around that. This group here, I think you're just adamantly absorbing everything I'm saying and I'm forgetting there's a screen behind me that you're all looking at, like they're all staring at me, just soaking in every word I have to say and you guys are looking at the screen. So this is just some examples of what your lawn or lawnless yard could look like. Um, the top right picture you notice, it's half and half. So they took out the front part closest to the street and kept some turf next to the house. So you don't necessarily have to take all, out all your lawn. Um, again, when we're making our plan, that might be a very overwhelming project. So maybe pick a few sections, maybe take out this strip and then work your way away from the house or closer to the house and removing some turf. Um, if you're up for it, you can take it all out um, in one shot. And I've got some pictures of how to do that. But this is just to encourage you that you can have nice alternatives that are low water users and it doesn't have to be turf. So this is actually our environmental horticulture advisor's house up in Folsom and she took out her front lawn. So basically her first step, and I think we've got it written down here, is she stopped watering just completely you know, killed off the lawn by lack of irrigation. Um, you can use glyphosate, which is Roundup, if you're impatient and you wanna help speed up the process of not watering and applying Roundup to it to help keep, kill off the weeds. <clears throat> then she scalped, which is basically, she just set her lawnmower on the lowest setting and went through and you know the, the fluffiness of the lawn that was there helping to keep moisture and she got rid of that. So she went down as low as she could go to help the lawn dry out even faster. And then she did cut out where she has her concrete walkway. She did get in and make sure she cut out the turf in and around that so that it didn't start growing in again from where roots may have encroached underneath her sidewalks or her driveway um, and things like that. There's a question. What kind, of, what kind of turf was that? You know, I don't know what. The question is what kind of turf was it? And I'm not sure what type it was. Um, some turf, again, like my Bermuda that grows through cement, <laughs> it seems like. Might not be this easy. This might have been a, a fescue of some kind because part of her uh, lawn is shaded. So she might have had like a cooler season turf in there that might have been easier to take out this way. Another thing that you could do would be sheet mulch um, or solarize. So you can add cardboard to this and that prevents the sun, the whole photosynthesis process from happening. If you block out the light, um, you're basically smothering it in the process. 
Uh, solarization is great to do in the valley here July, August, when it's really hot, usually. And that's where you take out whatever it is that you want to take out, and you actually apply a clear plastic. You would moisten the soil a little bit, and we have more information on this if you'd like more information on how to solarize. But basically, you bake what's there, and it kills weed seeds and grass seeds. It also kills the microbes so far down, so many inches, so you're also killing off the beneficials that might be in your soil, but they do repopulate quickly to come back. Um, so you don't have to feel too bad about doing that. But there's other things that you can do on top of this, of adding cardboard, perhaps. Like I said, um, newspaper, thick mats of newspaper that you keep watered so they don't blow away, just to, get, to make sure that that turf is gone. And then what she did um, is she went through and staked out what she wanted where, so that she had the visual. And she also did a, a drawing that went with this. But they actually went out and put tape and stakes in her front yard of where she wanted what to go. So she outlined her beds. Um, she tapped into the sprinklers that were there and put in new ir irrigation valves and emitters so that she can run. Um, and you're going to see what she put in here because there's a finished product. But she's got them raised because she's putting in beds, uh, raised planter beds in her front yard. And that was her finished product. So that is her yard. Um, we've got, I don't have a mouse on this, but I do have a pointer. So here are the raised beds that she had outlined. Here's her driveway up to the house. And then this right here is all uh, DG or decomposed granite. So the water will soak right through that if and when it does rain. Um, so we're not having extra runoff. She's got, she included a dry river bed, bed here. Um, and then does have some low water using plants out front towards the street. Her street would be like right here. And this is before she's planted it. So I should really get a picture from her of what it looks like now. You can also put landscape fabric down. That's one thing that I forgot to help suppress weeds um, and the, the grass seeds from growing. So there's some, a few other ways to remove uh, turf. We talked about applying herbicides. Um, sheet mulching, which was the cardboard or the newspaper method. Solarization, which was the plastic where we're heating up the soil. Um, physically removing it, so a sod cutter. We actually have um, a master gardener in Lodi, and I've got pictures, it's my next slide, who rented a turf cutter and, or sod remover, and her husband did that, and it looks like he's riding a bronching <laughs> bull or something. Like, he just kind of went all over the place. So I recommend having some muscle if you're going to operate a sod cutter. And if you're interested in removing turf, if you're web savvy, all you have to do is get online and you know, search turf removal, and there's lots of different ways and methods that would help you out. So here, if you can see that, here's her, Gordon on the left with the sod cutter. And then they're actually, they put black plastic down, and they put it down now, so it's a little early. Um, the black doesn't get as hot as the clear plastic, but it's what they had. They didn't want to go out and buy new clear plastic, and they are not in any hurry to do this. So they've actually, they cut out the sod, they rolled it up, and just basically, just as you would install, install new sod, that's what the sod cutter does, where you can roll up the sections that you've cut out and you haul it out. But they're still making sure that they're getting the seeds and, and any potential roots out by putting this uh, black plastic back uh, down on their front yard. And they actually live in an HOA that prior to them doing this had the, the regulation of no, you had to have so much front lawn, and basically they said, heck with it, we're taking out our lawn and we'll deal with it later, we'll deal with the, the penalties or the circumstances or whatever's gonna come, and because they did this and because what's coming down the pipeline from the state, their HOA association, or the Homeowners Association has actually modified the rules um, on this, as well as it's a state mandate that they can't enforce so much uh, turf right now. But they, they were the game changers in their neighborhoods. So we'll have to see how many people start taking out their front lawn. So for those that want to keep all of your lawn, or maybe part of it, there are some things that you can do to help conserve water just by having a healthy lawn. So um, again, like we said earlier in, in the prioritizing plants, that established turf was in the, the lowest category. And that's because many of them can get very dry and come back with just a deep irrigation. Um, think about the turf that you have. Is it serving a purpose? So if you have this large soccer field for a backyard, do you really need that much? Or can you start taking out bits and pieces? Do you have grandkids or kids or pets that you need to maybe keep some turf for 
Um, you know, you don't want to rip it all out if there's no place for the kids to play or the dog to go, um, you know, things like that you have to keep in mind. And then, you know, you can replace those, that non-essential turf, so the areas of turf that aren't used as much, with things like ground covers that would, you know, quickly grow to fill in the spot or maybe um, low water using perennials and shrubs or uh, hardscapes like decks or dry riverbeds, things like that. So there's lots of options if you take out part of your lawn. So when you water your lawn, the best time to water it if you are on some type of automated um, irrigation system would be between 2 and 8 in the morning. Basically, if you water your lawn at night, that is the best time versus even 10 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock at night. Those are the worst times to water um, during the day. And we're looking at the wind. We're looking at evaporation, even lower water pressure because everybody else in your neighborhood is washing clothes and dishes and showers and things like that. And so um, water use is most efficient during the evening. If you do it later in the evening, the, the 2 to 8 is recommended because if night temperatures do drop, um, we're getting close enough to dawn into the sun coming up, coming up that we're not going to have water standing on the turf. Say if we watered it 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock versus 4 o'clock in the morning, the sun's going to come up fairly soon and dry off any water that might be standing on top that potentially could lead to um, funguses and things that can grow on your grass if it stays moist, that humid moist where it's warm out but not quite warm enough to dry this, the water. We just want to avoid that. Um, adjust your irrigation schedule monthly to affect, um, reflect seasonal changes. And you know when it's warming up, you may need to go out and increase. As soon as the, the temperatures start dropping, as soon as it's raining, go out and back off or completely turn off your irrigation controller. And then cycle your irrigation schedule. So I know somebody was talking about that um, earlier before the talk um, tonight, that they water their lawn for five minutes, and then they have to wait and that might be due to the type of soil that you have. The water doesn't um, infiltrate fast enough. So if you water more than eight minutes, say it might be your magic m number, you might start seeing the water running off into the sidewalk or the street. So go out during the day, turn your sprinklers on, and see, time it, how long before the water starts puddling and starts running off your turf or, you know, going to the sidewalk or the street. And then set your sprinkler irrigation system to that interval. So runs for seven minutes and then give it time to absorb. It might be a half hour, it might be an hour, and then run another seven minutes until you've got all the water applied that those particular plants need. Is this typically better to do like seven minutes in the morning and then seven minutes at night, or is it better to just do it? It doesn't. Do it, do it in a, I mean, it really doesn't matter, but it's better to do, you know, run it for seven minutes and then wait the half hour and, and just get it done rather, because we really want the water to saturate through the soil and not have a lot of time. So if it was a really windy summer night and you watered at 10 o'clock for seven minutes and then you watered again at four o'clock for seven minutes, you know, it potentially could dry out in that time to where you're just re-watering the same, down to the same level of soil. And the way water moves through soils, water's not going to just go down in a, on a line. The whole area where water is being applied needs to become completely saturated before it'll continue to move down to the next layer of soil or the next horizon. So deep watering is best, if we can, as deep as we can get. But again, we don't want runoff and puddling, and we don't want to waste water. And there's the picture of the urban drool. So when you're mowing your lawn, mowing your lawn actually does connect back to um, water conservation and having healthy, healthy turf. You want to cut, you want to mow high. So many people like to mow low, they like a clean looking lawn, but you want to cut no more than the top third of your grass blades off. And you might have to mow a couple times in a week to get to an established height that you like, every time taking no more than a third of the top. So you're giving it a buzz cut, and then you're going to wait a few days and then give it another buzz cut to bring your turf down to a height that you want. But don't go out and just drop the mower to second to the lowest and go out and cut your turf at that height. Bring it, slowly bring it down and then maintain your turf at the height that you want, cutting the, with the one-third rule. And this helps to actually reduce the growth rate of your turf. Um, it helps to pre uh, prevent your turf from sunburn. So again, if we drop the mower too low, 
We can potentially lead to, to scalding and sunburn. Um, it helps to promote deeper root growth, so the, plant, the turf roots are going deeper into the soil. And it actually helps to um, shade and reduce the weeds. So the weeds is the big one. You have a healthier looking lawn if you are mowing properly and not allowing the weeds to get in. And then grass cycling is a concept where you take the bag off, um, and if you have a mulching mower, it's great because it crisscross cuts it. And if you have a regular mower, mower, that works too. But you leave the lawn clippings on the lawn. And those eventually decompose. It doesn't take very long. And you're adding organic nitrogen back to the turf. So you're not having to buy as much fertilizer or any fertilizer, perhaps, that you would apply. And it helps to reduce evaporation. So again, it's kind of its own natural layer of mulch that will decompose. Now on the flip side of that, if your lawn is overgrown and you mow it and it dries and it looks like you should come out and bale it, you know, to feed to the cows, we don't want to grass cycle when your lawn looks like that. We're talking about removing just the top third of the turf. You have all these little lawn clippings that you really won't even notice. The UC, uh, University of California, statewide has a fantastic website, and it includes information for new lawns, for established lawns, lawn insects, lawn weeds, lawn mushrooms that you can help get identification on, um, calculators that you put in the square footage of your lawn, and you have to know what type of turf you have. So if you don't know the type of turf that you have, there's actually an identification key that will walk you through so A or B, does your turf look like this or like this? Does it look like this or like this? And hopefully at the end, you get to the, the turf that you have. Um, but the, the calculators work that you put in the type of turf, square footage, and you can actually get the amount of water that should be applied, as well as there's a fertilizer calculator that will show you how much fertilizer that turf needs and how to space it out. So you don't want to put five pounds of nitrogen on all at once. We want to space it out over four times throughout the year, um, or whatever the magic calculation is that pertains to your, your turf. So it's, it's a very useful and user-friendly website. And it's a very long URL that's up there on the right-hand side, but you can get to it from our website. So if you grab a business card that's in the back, um, we have links to this website on our Master Gardener page. So planting for success. Let's move away from turf and talk about plants. So we really need to think and think twice and do some research before we just instantaneously or spontaneously buy um, the plants that are three for ten dollars at the local nursery or they just they're beautiful, they have beautiful flowers. Think about it. Um, right now is the worst possible time to be planting anything out in the garden. Um, you know, you, right now is a great time to be prepping. So if you're taking your turf out, start working on that now to prep for planting time. But think and research um, plants. Hydrozone. So if you, when you do plant, plant your plants that have similar water needs. So if they are a medium water user, put those together so that we're not underwatering because we've got very low, high, and a medium plant all in the same garden area. So this one needs, you know, your hydrangea needs way more water than the Ceanothus needs. So try to, if you're planting new plants, um, to, to take that into consideration, their water needs. And that's called hydrozoning. And there's my explanation. Plant in the fall or in the autumn. And that there's two benefits to that. Um, typically, it's cooler weather, so the plants aren't as stressed. And then um, any rain that we might get over winter will help water in those plants. Spring's another okay time to plant because it's cooler usually, but you are going to have to water more to get those plants established. Look at the plant. So make sure if you are buying something, make sure it's healthy. Look for pests. Look for healthy roots. So pull you know, out of the one-gallon pot. Loosen it up and pull it out and look at the roots. Is it, you know, in a one-gallon pot, does it only have roots that are an inch and a half? Or do the white, you know, feeder roots go all the way down to the bottom? At the same time, you also don't want a root ball where the roots aren't going to grow out once you've planted it. So you want healthy roots. You don't want mushy, rotten roots. Um, you don't want to bring home any pests or insects or disease-looking plants. So just make sure that they're they're healthy. And if you don't want, if you're not comfortable taking the plants out of the containers, go ask one of the nursery people. Tell them, you know, I want to buy this, but before I do, I want you to take it out so that I can take a look at the root system and, and see how it looks. 
and buy small, um, except for slow growers. So if it's a, you know, again, this goes back to researching your plants and knowing how fast they grow. But if it's something that's slow, you can typically buy bigger. But many of the plants um, in the valley with the warm summers, once they're established, are quickly to grow, you know, or they grow quickly. So think about what you're planting, how big it's going to get, and buy small. It'll save you some money. It'll save water that you have to water to get it established. So a larger five gallon plant is gonna take more water to become established than a one gallon plant will be. And once those roots have you know, established themselves deeper in the soil, they're gonna find their own water sources um, within the water table and within the soil. Um, something to keep in mind, everyone, you know, I'm, I'm all for California natives, but something to keep in mind is that even California natives need to be watered about the first year to become established. That's a very small bullet point, so I'm not sure why. That's what that says. So they're not drought tolerant. A drought tolerant plant or a low water using plant will eventually be low water using or drought tolerant or a Mediterranean plant um, once it's established. You can't just stick it in the ground and walk away from it and expect it to thrive. A year or two down the road, yes. But that's why we, we you know, it might even be more beneficial to keep established plants in your yard than ripping them out thinking, I'm gonna plant all low water using drought tolerant plants because you're gonna have to water those in versus the shrub that you water every two weeks. You're gonna be using more water on these new plants. So just keep those things in mind as you're buying and planting. So we are in a Mediterranean climate. Um, so you know, look for plants as you're researching that are California natives that grow well in a Mediterranean climate that are low water users. You can use succulents. Um, summer dry bulbs are another great one. And again, pick the right plant for the right place. So see how big is the end product going to be? Is it going to be too big or too small? Um, many times people will buy 10 of something because they're tiny and then how many, you know, you're ripping out plants because it's just overgrown and there's way too much in a garden. So have patience. I think I would throw that in the next time I give this is have some patience as you're waiting for your plants to grow and become established. So plants, most plants are high water users and this just gives you an idea. Trees take three to five years of regular watering before they become, are, are established to where you can back off watering and you don't have that risk of losing them due to a lack of water. Shrubs are a full year of regular watering and perennials are a year or a spring and a summer if you planted them in the spring. If you planted them in the fall and if we had any rain, that timeline's going to change some. But if you did a early spring planting, you're looking at about a year or the full spring of having to water them regularly before they're established enough to, to back off the watering. And this is just more, this is our demo garden when it was very young. Now this is all nice and grown in. So rule of thumb, um, new plantings, frequent, you have to water them frequently until the roots have grown. Again, we talked about this. Summer, you can water every two to three days. Spring, fall, one time a week. So that's just elaborating on the, on the previous slide. And to see if the roots, you can just dig shallow you know, with your hands, spread the soil, move the soil to see how far down are the roots going. Dig a hole adjacent to it to see if you can see where the roots are in relationship to the depth of the soil. So research plants that are low water users. Um, there's the water use classification of landscape species, or wuckles, or wuckles, depending on how you want to say it. And there's over 3,500 plant species um, or groups that are adaptable, adaptable and plants that will do well in California, that grow in California. So we're not looking at plants from Minnesota or you know, Texas or Canada. These are all plants um, in California. And this was a project that was part of the University of California and the Department of Water Resources uh, did this project. So there's a lot of science behind this, lots of science, uh, weather stations, and they've basically come up with the amount of water that plants need for all these 3,500 plants, families. So many times, you know, people ask, well, how much water does my, how, uh, how often, how long do I water my plant? And our, as master gardeners, we're trying to say it depends. It depends on the plant. It depends on how much output might be in your irrigation system, if it's drip or if you're watering with the hose. I mean, there's so many factors that come into play. But 
This website, um, and I'm going to walk you through a few pictures, makes life easy for you. So it's hard to see the boxes, but the box on the left, it basically has um, check mark boxes, and you can pick more than one. What type of what type of plant are you looking for? A tree, a ground cover, a shrub, um, you know, flower colors, things like that. Uh, shade, sun, full sun, part sun, you know, all these different things. And then when you, I should back up, before you get to the screen, you're going to enter your zip code. So that's the first step. So it's going to know exactly what USDA zone that you are in. Um, and then this would be the second screen of customizing the plants that you're looking for. So you, you want ground covers. That's all we're going to pick. Um, and then when you click submit, it gives you this list. I think this one, it's small on my, my computer, but I want to say 300 and something plant options came up that fit my search criteria for this sample search. So this is the, the first web address that was on the previous screen. Now, Waterwonk was the second web URL that you should have printed in your handout. And it uses the same data, the same program as that Wuckles or Wuckles, except for Waterwonk, the people that created this website went the extra step. And so I had the same search results. I put in the same criteria. I had the same 323 plants. They give pictures. So you, OK, great. You have a plant name. You have no idea what it looks like. Is it red flowers? Is it you know, grayish, greenish leaves, or you know, bright green, or dark green? And so now you can look at um, pictures. And all the pictures for the Waterwonk website are uh, connected to Flickr. So it's a collection. They may have more. Some might have less. But at least it gives you an idea of what you're looking at. And I should say with both of these, you can um, the water wonk one over on the far right, there's a column where you can check plants and you can create a plant list. So basically, you can save the plants that you like and then print those out so that when you go shopping or now you're looking online for plants or at the local nursery, you can say, do you have any of these plants? If not, can you order them for me? And I can tell you the big box nurseries typically won't do that. But if you have a significant plant list and you go to your mom and pop nursery, if it's an opportunity for them to make some money, they will most likely contact their local distributor to say, hey, do you have these plants? And they many times, mom and pop local nurseries will do special orders of plants for customers um, if there's a request, a demand for those plants. Not all the time, but most will. So this just explains what does high, medium, and low water use mean. And this relates back to the, the Wolkos program, because your options were high, medium, low, and actually very low. There's a very low category. And so um, high water is uh, well-watered turf, soil not allowed to dry out. So basically, we're keeping the turf consistently wet. And frequent irrigation more than one time per week. That was, that's all the high plants would be high in that category. Medium um, is typically most shrubs and trees. Uh, the top of the soil dries out before in between irrigations. And you're looking at maybe one time per week. Low is drought tolerant, heat tolerant plants. Um, plant roots are deep and tolerate dry soil surfaces so they don't become stressed as easily. And you water them every two to four weeks. And then very low are plants that, again, once the, these, this applies to all of them, once they're established, very low plants um, require no summer water needed unless we're in a drought. So like this year, we'd have to water them. Um, but we have some at the demo garden that are on every two months. They get a very short irrigation cycle to them, and they look fantastic. They are full of blooms, full of pollinators. Um, they're big ceanothus bushes that are huge. And you couldn't tell that we're watering them once every two months or, or more than that. So again, this is the hydrozoning. This is a duplicate. Um, Spacing of plants, so often we like to crowd plants in so that it looks nice when we plant it because we're very impatient people and we don't want to allow the plants to grow to their full size and fill in the space. But fewer plants share the same amount of water. If you're planting you know, heavy and you're going to require more water to establish all those plants. So just, and again, you're probably over planting due to the size that those plants will become. So plant light and it'll give them time. Uh, planting trees, here's a few tips on planting trees. Uh, you don't want to plant, you want to make your hole no deeper than the root ball, but twice as wide. So many, you know, deeper is not better. You want to go twice as wide, as deep as the container it came in. 
Um, we don't, research has shown from the university that we don't want to amend the soil that we're backfilling into it. So we want to backfill our trees with the, the soil that we dug out of the hole. We don't want to add anything to it when we're putting the soil back in. Um, if you have clay soil, which is not typically the case here, but you want to gouge, so you've, you've dug your hole and you kind of have that smooth, slick surface from the shovel going in, so we want to poke some holes in there for water and root infiltration so that it doesn't just make a, a bucket in the soil. And our final goal is we want to have the crown of the tree slightly at soil, or I would say slightly above, so that as you water it, it settles. But we don't want to have the crown below the soil because then again we're leading to crown rot and trees don't do well if they're planted too low. So you can see in that diagram the, the, where the tree was at in the container that it came in, if it was a container tree, it's going to be even with the top of our soil. You can break up the soil. I, didn't, I forgot to mention that. So you can loosen the soil in the hole um, so that the roots and water can penetrate, but definitely use the native soil. Make a berm. We've got a picture of that. So the first year, you want to make a berm around newly planted trees. And notice that it's like the tree's on its own little island. We don't just have a well dug where the water sits up against the tree trunk. It's in a ring around the tree. And we want to knock that berm down after, after a year, fill it in so that it's, it's not a, a well that we water. This is what you don't want to do. You don't want to dig a hole and put the entire pot into the ground. And we actually had that out at our ag center. Um, some of the, we didn't plant them, the, the landscape guys that came in when they built the building. Some of the trees that we've taken out that were doing poorly were doing poorly because they, they basically cut out the bottom of the pot and stuck the whole pot into the soil and then backfilled it back in. And so make sure you take the tree out of the container that it comes in. So we don't want to plant too high, we mentioned that. We don't want to leave the soil in large clods, so the hole that you've dug, if it's, you know, break up the soil. Um, we don't want to put bark into the soil, so again, just put the soil that you dug out back into the hole. Um, you're watering for trees, again, it all goes back to knowing your soil type and your irrigation system, but make sure, you know, those first two to three, five years can be very crucial for a tree and getting the root zone established. Slower, deeper watering is definitely better, and I've got a picture of how to water, I did that one, how to water trees. This is what you don't want to do, and eventually, there we go. Um, as you, to, to increase your root depth, Every time you irrigate, the irrigation cycle goes for a little bit longer every time. And that will allow the water to go deeper and deeper and allow the roots to go deeper and deeper. And a lot of these were repeated in previous slides. So many people think that I need to water right next to the trunk of the tree to get to the roots. And realistically, um, the roots that absorb water for the tree that aren't the anchor roots. So the anchor roots are gonna, that hold the tree up go much deeper. But the feeder roots and the water roots um, are typically in the top foot to two feet of the soil level. And your drip line typically goes out to the edge or the canopy of your tree. So we, we can water, make a big uh, circle where your leaves end um, with that drip, inline drip emitters that we were talking about, the, the drip tape or however, soaker hose or whatever it is that you're using. Or if you're Watering with a hose, you know, water away from the trunk of the tree because that's where your roots are and you want to encourage those roots to continue to go out and you don't want your roots to just go straight down um, because that's when we see many trees blow over in the wind or if it is an excessive rainy year and the water's soggy, they blow over because they don't have anything holding them out laterally. So don't water just at the, the trunk of the tree. So the last thing to talk about are hardscapes. And this is just something that you can do to uh, free up some lawn space. So maybe if you've taken out some lawn, what you can do. Um, all of these examples that I have up today um, are low maintenance. Some of them are repurposed items. So maybe you have a pile of bricks in the back or your neighbor is taking out their cement sidewalk and they have all the cement they need to get rid of. Um, those are all things that you can incorporate into hardscapes, and it would be either very cheap or free. All of these also are water permeable. So the pavers 
we're just putting sand in. We're not cementing anything in. We want water, when it does rain, to infiltrate and absorb into the ground. Um, this bottom one here is another example of the decomposed granite. This one here, we actually have this, if you do come out to our Ag Center, this is a water permeable sidewalk. And so if you come out and pour, this is not at our Ag Center, but we have the same thing. If you poured a cup of water on our sidewalk that runs through the demo garden, it's not gonna run off. It's gonna go straight down and it absorbs back into the soil. So this is an option. It's a little more expensive um, of an option versus you know, pavers or even the decomposed granite. And I think I have one more slide of hardscapes. Here we've got the, the dry riverbed, top left, if the laser was working. So sidewalk, water permeable. Um, it could even be that you leave spaces that you fill with sand or something in between your sections of cement. So if, you, you know, if cement's the only option you're going with, then give yourself some room for water to run and run down instead of running out in the street and down the gutter. And then again, more pictures of pavers. The bottom right one is repurposed cement. So that was one where somebody took out cement and then they just went and you can see it's different shapes and sizes and edges and they just buried it and then filled it in with soil and sand and whatever their mix was to keep it in place. So a few more, and these are duplicates from the first talk, but a few more things that you can do to conserve water. Um, it's not really related to installing, but it's definitely related to conserving water out in the landscape. We talked about getting rid of weeds. They compete with your plants for soil nutrients and water. Um, deadhead your flowers. So once your flowers are dried up and they aren't looking too good, go out and, and cut them because your plant is using lots of energy to try to keep those flowers alive or send them to seed, which is what plants naturally do is they want to bolt, they want to reproduce. Um, so if you're if you don't care if they produce seeds that are going to drop, um, go out and cut them and it'll help conserve some water within the plant. Stop fertilizing or at least slow down on the fertilizing. So the more we fertilize, we're encouraging our plants to grow and the more a plant grows, the more water that it needs. So just be considerate of that. Um, also if we're reducing the amount of water that we're applying to our plants and we're still fertilizing like we always have been. Um, you're, typically, you're going to see a buildup of salts because fertilizers have salts in them, and if we're not watering them and allowing the water to leach the salts through the soil, you can get a salt buildup, which then can burn your plants. So the edges, the margins of your leaves might look crispy, um, and that could be from a salt accumulation from fertilizing, and we're just not watering enough to move those fertilizers through the soil. Avoid heavy pruning. That's also related to plant growth. So if you go out and just aggressively prune, we're going to have all this new, young, vibrant growth that we're going to encourage. And again, that's going to require more water. So kind of just go out and do maintenance pruning. Um, again, prune um, in the fall, depending, or depending on what plants you have. Um, research that a little bit. But you know, don't, don't go out and, and cut everything back to the ground if it doesn't need to go back to the ground. You know, just reshape it or get rid of some, you know, dead branches or things like that. But try to avoid heavy pruning. Use a broom. Um, a garden hose can use 10 gallons of water per minute. And that's actually one of the state mandates is that you can't even use a garden hose to spray off your sidewalks or anything like that. That's on, on the things that we all can't do. Um, use a broom just to sweep everything off. And recycle water whenever possible. So I was joking at the beginning about catching shower water or, you know, but if it's just going down the drain and you have room to put a, a pan or something or pots or if it rains and you want to put things out to catch water or if you have a system where you can get your hands on some barrels to collect rainwater from your gutters when it does rain, um, all those things will help. We have a master gardener who has rain barrels and I huge rain barrels that the normal everyday person couldn't get unless your son works for a water agency like his son does. But he has four of them, like there's these cisterns on one of his tool sheds and it's thousands of gallons of water he has just from this last winter and we didn't get very much rain. But rather than it all just running off and absorbing back into the soil where he doesn't have anything planted, he now has little spigots on that and he can either hook up his hose or fill up watering cans and go around and water um, plants within his garden and his patio. So every little bit helps. I think I even said last time, your coffee pot. So rather than pouring your coffee water, whatever's left over, um, 
you can either dilute it if you have some, you know, cups of water or something, or you can pour it onto the plants. But plants like coffee grounds that you put into a compost pile, and so your coffee water has been diluted, and you can actually use that to water landscape plants instead of just pouring it down the sink. And it won't be hurting the plants. So our Master Gardener website has a whole page dedicated to water conservation, and we've got it broken down to water conservation in the landscape, irrigation, and it's really nothing that we created. It's just trying to act as a home page to send you off to many resources that are available um, on different topics, on irrigation, on landscape conversation, conservation, on turf. There's a whole section on, on turf and conservation. And so we, I hope you visit um, our website if you do have any more questions or just to find out other resources that are available. Whew. So do you guys have any questions? I'm just going to mention that I had a guy come out and uh, he aerated my yard. Oh, that's another good thing. That was in the first presentation, but I took that slide out. You know, even though I planted soil, the ground was really hard. Yeah. But having that guy go out and aerate uh, the front and back yard. So do you know what, everybody know what aeration is? Where you pull the little plugs out, so you can you can rent aerators or you can you know pay somebody to come out, mow and blow company that'll come out and do something like that, and it really does. It pulls those cores out, and you leave them on your lawn, and those cores will break back down um, and work their way back into the soil. But it really does help with water penetration in your turf. And there's thatch. There's all kinds of things when it comes to turf. Of if you have a thick layer of thatch, which is kind of that straw-looking layer, so you've got the nice green on top. And then before the nice green on top in the soil, there's that, looks like straw, that's thatch. There's actually thatch removers, so cutters that'll go through and pull out that dead grass that it just accumulates. And that also will help water penetrate through um, because you've got dried grass that water's just absorbing into before it's even hitting the soil. So having a healthy lawn, there's, I, I took out slides because I didn't want it to go any longer than we've already gone. But yeah, the healthy turf of aerating and, and dethatching also can help conserve water. So just for those that want to check out the website, Ted, is this possible to put the PowerPoint on the website as well, on t along with the, the recording? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click through it just real quick. But there's about 70 slides of plants that are low or very low. Some are moderate that I threw in, but that shows you what they look like, a few things about them. You know, here's a Ceanothus. This is the Ray Hartman. It's a low water user, and it does great. So. I'm not going to go through all these now. You guys can go to the website and take a look at them or use those tools that I talked about, um, you know, of, of plant finders. But there's lots of pretty pictures of low water use plants that have the Latin name as well as the common name that you would find in the, the nurseries. So again, I'm blowing through them, but just to give you an idea that those are up there. So, okay. Well, if there's no other questions, did everybody get a raffle ticket? Who didn't get a raffle ticket, I should say? Everybody get one? Two of our garden journals, and I'm going to wrap it off the mug too, but I'm currently using a few uh, holder tickets, so help me. <laughs> we'll have to wash this when we get home. <laughs> so, Ted, if you don't have a second ticket in here, I'll let you draw out three. Okay, we'll do the two garden journals first. And
be able to get some of that. It shouldn't be. It should be anyone that's willing.